Hello, it's a great pleasure to give this uh, keynote at the 7th uh, IEEE Congress on Information Science and Technology. I'm very sorry that I cannot be there in, uh, in person. I had many uh, challenges. I would have loved to, to join you, but unfortunately that is not possible. So my name is Will van der Raalst and I'm a professor at RWTH Aachen University. I'm also the chief scientist of Salonis, which is the leading company in the field of, uh, of process mining. So in this talk, I would like to explain to you what object-centric process mining is, and I will show that moving from traditional process mining to object-centric process mining is similar to moving, let's say, from two dimensions to three dimensions. And why I'm using this metaphor, you will find out, uh, let's say, during this uh, talk. So process mining is a super exciting technology because it combines process science and data science. In the past, people would often focus on process modeling, process analysis, and it would all be model-based without using actually the data. On the other hand, there are many people working on machine learning, data science, uh, uh, various forms of AI that typically are not interested in process models at all. Uh, and they focus very much on the data and data sources like uh, text and images, etc. So process mining is this unique combination of both uh, data science and process science, as is indicated uh, here. So I started working on process mining, let's say, around 25 years ago. Where, and at that point in time, I was the only person systematically uh, working on this. So if you look at process mining, then um, like you first start by extracting event data from source systems, like for example, SAP, Oracle, or any other enterprise system that's being used. Most organizations do not have a single system, but they have hundreds, sometimes thousands of different systems that are supporting processes. So a challenge is to extract the data in such a way that you can do process mining. That's step zero. Then step one is that you discover the actual uh, processes and that creates transparency. You can see what is really going on. Often this is very surprising and therefore it provides many, many opportunities for people to immediately see, let's say, things in the processes that they did not know about before that they can improve. However, however after the first shock, uh, you know what your processes look like uh, you start going uh, uh, to look at models that are more normative. And so you adapt your discovered process models in such a way that they better be describe not what is really happening, but what you would like to happen. And then using conformance checking techniques, you can actually see where reality is deviating, uh, let's say, from the, from the models that you have. So these are the first two steps of, uh, of process mining, and these steps are quite unique. And they are uh, unrelated to machine learning and any other technologies. In the third step, uh, you, you want to be forward-looking, or you would like to influence existing processes. And so based on uh, process models uh, aligned with the data that you have, you can make predictions. For example, you can predict whether there will be a bottleneck in your process tomorrow, or you will predict that a certain case that you're now handling is going to be delayed. So you can have these forward-looking techniques also in combination with, let's say, machine learning and simulation. But of course, in the end, there is the goal that you actually take actions and that you're actually influencing the process. And so this is process mining, let's say, uh, seen from a top-down uh, view. And in this uh, uh, keynote, I'm going to talk about object-centric process mining I'm going to, 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 to explain to you that the challenges are often in extracting the data, as I just illustrated, that if you do that, uh, you typically get spaghetti-like processes. Processes are, uh, let's say, have much more variability than what people think. And this provides opportunities to improve processes. Also, I will show that object-centric process mining helps you to exploit, let's say, innovations in AI, like, for example, large language models. So we have a full agenda, so simply let's get started. Um, so I'm often using the spaghetti metaphor. Yeah? So if people 
uh, think about their processes and they make flowcharts, they are typically very, very, very simple, right? The processes look, look fairly straightforward. People make a flowchart and typically people think about the process as being very linear. First this activity, then this activity, etc., etc. So it looks a bit like this. And then if people start using process mining, they are often shocked to see what they really find is more looking more like this. That's why we talk about spaghetti processes. You would like to have a lasagna process with a lot of structure, but it's typically like this. And this is the, the, the reality. And this is partly caused, of course, by the variability that processes have. But as I will uh, state, uh, state, it is also partly uh, caused by the way that we look at these processes. And that's why we need to look at these processes in three dimensions rather than in two dimensions. If you look at them in two dimensions, you see something like this. If you look at them in three dimensions, distinguishing different types of objects, it suddenly becomes much more structured and much more simple. But let's start with the basics, because I assume that some of you are not very familiar with, uh, with the recent breakthroughs in, in process mining. So if you ask people what do they want to happen, they would draw a process like the one that you're seeing here. Yeah, so it would be very linear. Uh, people have an idea of what they would like to happen. And in many cases, this is also the way that the process is being executed. Of course, people know that there are certain deviations that they are confronted with. So if they would make a PowerPoint, it would have a bit like this structure. Yeah, so this is about the handling of, of orders. And they see that sometimes certain steps are being skipped or, or, or things are happening not in the right order. So we know of a few typical deviations of the process, of the idealized process, and uh, that would be the process in the middle. However, if you start doing process mining, what you often see is like the diagram that you see here on the right. So processes are very spaghetti-like, uh, and this provides a lot of information for organizations to actually improve the processes. Because if they think about their processes as it is shown here in the middle, and in reality, we see what is happening on the right, of course, uh, uh, this will lead to lots of uh, trouble. So processes have a lot more variability than expected, right? And, and this is very valuable because now you can start looking at the actual behavior and you can look at the actual uh, execution gaps and problems that you would like to, to address. However, this is not the only thing. If you look at these uh, models, and these are so-called directly follows graphs, yeah? so these are models where the nodes represent activities and the connections are simply representing that one activity is followed by the other activity. You can also think of this as a transition system or a Markov chain yeah, where the nodes are the activities. If you look at it like, like this, then uh, if things are happening in a different order, you immediately start seeing loops. And I will explain this in a minute. So one of the central messages of this talk is that I will uh, show to you that yes, there is a lot of variability in these processes, but it is partly also caused by the way that we are visualizing and the way that we are mining these processes. Uh, part of the, the, the spaghetti-like structure is caused by the fact that we use DV DFGs that focus on a single case notion. If you exploit the fact that you can model concurrency and that you can model multiple types of objects at the same time, you can simplify these views a lot. I will not dwell on, let's say, uh, how important it is that process models are able to capture concurrency. This has been ongoing research, and I spent, uh, let's say, two decades uh, on, on this problem. You will find lots of papers. There are lots of algorithms that do not discover a directly follows graph, but that do discover for example, a PetriNet or a BPMN model or a UML activity diagram or whatever notation that also allows for modeling concurrency. That is very nicely illustrated here. So what you see on the left is a directly follows graph. And what you see on the top uh, right is a so-called BPMN model discovered using the inductive mining algorithm. And what you see is that uh, both models describe the same uh, amount of behavior that we have seen in the data. Here we are focusing on the mainstream behavior. 
So both are capturing 60% of the cases that are in the process. But what you see is that in the uh, directly follows um, graph that you see on the left, there are lots of loops uh, that are actually caused by things not happening in a fixed order. If you discover concurrency, then you have the PPMN model that you see, for example, at the top. And for example, a create delivery and say, create sales item are not happening often in a fixed order. Yeah, so they, they, in most situations, they both happen, but they do not happen in, in a fixed order. And, and that's why it's very important to have these end gateways that describe uh, the concurrency that is there. So concurrency has been something that has been investigated a lot in the process mining domain. And there are lots of algorithms already starting with the classical health algorithm that I de developed that are capturing, let's say, this phenomenon. What is relatively new is the realization that we often look at multiple uh, types of cases interacting with each other. And if we try to create a process model that describes all of these different object types at the same time, you can think of that as looking at the process in two dimensions, although it actually has three dimensions. And the third dimension is, let's say, the color of the spaghetti. Yeah, so that's why we often talk about rainbow spaghetti uh, processes, where there is structure, but uh, because we do not see the color of the spaghetti, we are kind of missing this. So I'm going to show you an example to, to make this uh, point. So what you see here is a directly follows graph based on a data set that uh, uh, describes, let's say, 2,000 orders. Uh, there are almost 8,000 items and over 17,000 events. Yeah, so for example, event is like placing an order, confirming an order, picking an item, etc., etc. What you can see here is that on average an order uh, contains approximately, let's say, four items. And what you see is that uh, uh, each of these items need to be picked, but sometimes it is out of stock and you need to handle it. What you see here on the, on the right hand side are some typical variants. These are just examples. If you look at all the variants that you see among these 2000 orders, there are over 1000 variants. Yeah, so there's lots of variability. And if you look at the directly follows graph that tries to describe this, you see lots of loops, right? Uh, so you can see it's very difficult to see the structure of the process that is here. So you could think, okay, although this process is very small, this is like a spaghetti-like process, so there must be lots of problems here, but it's actually caused by the way that we are looking at uh, the, this process. And Orders and items are entangled here, and if we disentangle them, we get process models that are much easier. Let me try to prove this. So if I just focus on the activities related to an order, and I forget about the items for, 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 for a minute, then we get a process model that looks very simple. Yeah, so uh, first place order, then confirm order, and at the end there is a pay order. And sometimes we send a reminder, and it is possible that we send multiple reminders. Yeah, so therefore there are six variants, as you can also see on the right. Let's now take a look at items. And also here, we, uh, here it's very simple, right? We have just two variants. Yeah, so after the order is placed, remember that on average an order contains approximately, let's say, four, four items. But here we look at the flow of items. And for an item that was placed in an order, some are out of stock and you need to reorder them before they pick them and others you can directly pick. So there are only two variants. So if we now compare this, if we look at uh, this entangled process where we try to describe items and orders in one uh, let's say, model without identifying the fact that there are these different types of, uh, of objects. We have, let's say, 1000 variants, very, very complicated. If we only look at the, uh, let's say, uh, if we are able to disentangle the orders and items, we get something that is very simple. Yeah? So we just have six variants uh, for the orders and just two variants for the different orders. So using object-centric process mining, we are uh, exploiting this structure and we create models that look much more uh, uh, simple. 
But it is not just a matter of simplicity. What we also see is that if we have different types of objects and we try to squeeze them into the same uh, model using the single case notion, uh, we also have lots of, let's say, distortions. Yeah, so the typical things that are very well known are divergence and convergence. And so if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the problem of divergence is that your model shows connections between activities which are very misleading. And so for example, here there is a connection between pick item and item out of stock. But if you remember correctly, uh, like at the item level, it was always the case that either there was no item out, that the item was not out of stock and you could pick it immediately. Uh, or when it was out of stock, you would first uh, uh, de detect that, then you reorder it, and then you would only have to pick item. This structure is completely lost because you can see that basically everything is connected with everything. So this is the divergence problem. You're no longer able to see the real causalities. This model is not wrong, but it becomes misleading because we squeeze everything into single cases leading to this complicated uh, process model. The other problem is convergence. And so what we could also have done here is that we say, okay, we, we now take as a case notion the items and look at the other activities that are related to that. But then the frequency of place order would be almost, let's say, 8,000 times, although it happened only 2,000 times. So whatever we do, whether we choose a case notion that is very fine-grained or a case notion that is very coarse-grained, uh, we have these types of distortions. So in traditional process mining, what we are doing, we are looking at one object time at the same. And by doing that, we can avoid some of the problems that I have just mentioned. But at the same time, many of the inefficiencies uh, are caused by interactions between the different object types. So instead of creating an event lock per object type, you would like to, uh, to recognize that if an, an activity is being executed, it may involve multiple objects that are interacting with each other. So object-centric process mining starts from a more realistic view on the data and the processes that, uh, uh, that are described by the data. So one event may refer to multiple objects and we want to discover models that combine all of these different object types. Just as an example that you get a bit of a feeling for what are possible object types that may play a role. So imagine the scenario where, uh, where a customer places a sales order at the company, then uh, the order consists of four items. And let's now assume that not all of the items are in stock. Actually, only one is in stock. And for three of the four items, we still need to produce it. And so the sales orders are uh, triggering production orders. Then if we look at the shipments, there are two shipments because the item that was in stock could be shipped immediately. Uh, the other three items first had to be produced and were shipped later. And so what we see here is that four items end up in two shipments belonging to the same uh, sales order. And finally, there is one invoice. This is a very simple scenario still. Think about shipments that may contain items of different orders. And so there may be many to many relationships between different types of objects. What we are doing with object process, uh, object-centric process mining is that we are capturing reality more as it is by acknowledging the fact that there are multiple object types and they are interacting with each other and that one event may, for example, refer to one order, one customer, three items, etc. etc. And so I hope that this shows by seeing the different types of objects we are able to see in three dimensions rather than the two dimensions that we had before. So why is object-centric process mining so, uh, so important? And why is it so, uh, uh, so, so valuable? And so one of the things that uh, is an immediate benefit of using object-centric process mining is that you can avoid repeatedly going back to your source, uh, source systems. In the classical setting, each time you want to, to, to create a process model, you need to extract the data. And 
what you would like to see is also determining the data that you want to abstract. If you think about object-centric event data, you're capturing the, the, the events and the objects as they have appeared in reality. And based on that, you can basically immediately create your views without going back to the, to the source system. And so we say this is a system agnostic single source of truth. The other very important innovation is that we are able to see now the interactions between different object types. So for example, if you have problems delivering, uh, let's say, goods to a customer, this may be caused by problems with your supplier. This may be caused by problems in, uh, with the log logistics department. It may be related to problems in the sales department. There may be a problem in production, etc., etc. So it is not enough to look at a single object type uh, in isolation. You need to relate them. And object-centric process mining is doing that exactly. So we recognize that there are different object types but we are able to relate them uh, to each other, both in the way that we store the data and the way that we analyze the data. Finally, and I hope that my example helped there, we avoid distortions. Right? There are the convergence and divergence problems that I talked about uh, before. Using object-centric process mining, you do not have these distortions anymore. Think about 2D, 2D and 3D. Sometimes if you look at something uh, let's say, uh, at the two-dimensional picture, there may be certain things that you do not see. And so think of distortions that do not allow you to see, let's say, depth or things may be uh, seemingly very misleading. If you are able to walk around it and look at it from any angle, you are able uh, to see the actual, uh, uh, let's say, production process problems or healthcare problems or whatever application you're looking at. So in our group, we have been uh, working on object-centric process mining for, uh, for quite a few years. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we are, let's say, developing lots of algorithms, lots of software. But we also think it's very important to standardize uh, uh, this type of event data. And so event data where it is possible that an event may refer to multiple objects at the same time. So here you see a, a, a UML class diagram that at a very high level describes this new standard of storing data. So we have events and objects. Both events and objects are typed. And so we have event types, which we typically call activities. Objects can have types. For example, the object type customer, the ob object type supplier, the object type product or item. Uh, of course, events and objects can have attribute values and very important, what you can see clearly in this diagram in the middle, is that an event may be related to multiple objects and one object may be related to multiple events. And so, for example, if we have uh, an event place order, we may refer to an order object and multiple item objects. These relations can be uh, qualified. And what you can also see is that we are able to describe relationships between objects. And so, for example, if you are looking at an assembly process, you can model the bill of material, let's say, in the data that you are looking at. Events are timed. If you want, you can also, uh, let's say, type uh, time uh, updates to objects. So, if you look at the URL here at the bottom of the slide, you can see, uh, let's say, a website that provides you with a description of this uh, standard. So this specification is described formally. We provide this meta model, but we also provide several standardized exchange uh, formats. Uh, we have XML, JSON, and we have a relational format uh, that, for example, you can store uh, in a uh, SQL database. Um, so, so here you see, let's say, a small illustration of that. I do not want to go in detail. You can go to the website and look at all the details. But we also provide software that allows you to, to, to let's say, transform the XML format into a relational format, into a JSON format, etc., etc. And so uh, there, there's a lot of support for storing and, and transforming this data. We also provide data sets. We feel that that is very uh, important. And so we have these, uh, let's say, uh, 
open access data sources that you can use uh, to, to get started. Uh, we also provide, uh, let's say, a variety of different tools. Uh, so tools to discover, tools that are able to do conformance checking, tools to visualize this type of data, etc. etc. However, I do not want to talk about specifics of a particular tool. I would like to more describe this as an area where all the things that I was talking about before for process mining can be improved using, let's say, this more three-dimensional view on, on the data. So this is super exciting. Uh, here you see some screenshots of, of the uh, tools. So what you also see is that if you start looking at many object types at the same time, as so here we are looking at six object types, and 16 activities, it looks immediately, uh, let's say, very complicated because we are now seeing all the different object types. Normally, we just look at one of them or we would, let's say, merge them into a single case leading to the problems that I indicated before. However, you can select activities, you can select object types and then you can basically seamlessly simplify yeah, things. And so here you can see that we are looking at three object types in the PetriNet uh, view and looking at all related activities. Note that the models that you're looking at have been automatically discovered based on this more realistic uh, data. You can even make it more uh, simple. And so here I filtered out a few infrequent activities and then uh, the, the process looks, uh, let's say, much uh, clearer. So, what I just showed were, let's say, open source implementations that we have uh, realized. Uh, I'm also the chief scientist of Salonis, and these ideas have also been implemented in the Salonis uh, software. And so uh, what you see here is, let's say, a visualization of process sphere. Uh, in the meantime, let's say things have been, uh, let's say, moving on. So we provide uh, multi-object directly follows graphs in the Process Explorer. There is also the Process Adher Adherence Manager that allows you both to discover, modify such models, do conformance checking, do filtering, do performance analysis, uh, measure compliance, etc. Et so what you see here is, uh, let's say, just Says a few screenshots that, that give an idea. So the different colors are referring to the different object types. Again, if you look at many object types and many activities at the same time, it looks very complicated. If we select a few uh, uh, of these object types, uh, things often get uh, simpler. And so here we are looking at the applicants, applications and offers uh, with the different uh, colors. And you can see how the objects are uh, interacting. And so in the process, you can see where uh, people get an offer, where the three, uh, let's say, object types uh, converge. Behind the scenes, the inductive mining algorithm is being uh, used. And that algorithm, as you can see, can also discover concurrency. You can click on any uh, pair of activities and you can see how many cases, or uh, I should be more precise, how many objects of a particular type are flowing from one activity to another activity and how long this takes on average. Uh, so this provides very powerful insights. It, look, it sounds like, okay, all the work has been done, but that is definitely not uh, the case. There are still many uh, challenges. This is the picture that I showed you at the beginning. And for each of the tasks, extracting the data, discovering process models, doing conformance checking, predicting, uh, let's say, things like, uh, will there be a bottleneck? Uh, will there be a delay? Uh, and also acting based on these types of information need to be reinvented to exploit this more rich view on the data that we have now. That provides many opportunities. So that is what I wanted to say about object-centric process mining, and I hope that you see that this is an incredible uh, breakthrough. To conclude, I will also talk a bit about, uh, uh, let's say, the relationship of the, what I've been talking about to AI, machine learning, large language models, generative AI, etc., etc. It's kind of unavoidable. If you talk about exploiting data that you related to, let's say, these things that uh, are very visible, 
especially since, uh, let's say, the attention for ChatGPT and uh, Microsoft's Copilot, you can see that there is an increasing interest in, in, in these things. Well, one of the things that uh, object-centric process mining provides is that uh, the information that you have is richer, so it's more typed. And so you are able to talk about different types of objects and how they relate to each other. Uh, I'm showing here some, let's say, old papers, right? It's, it, it's kind of uh, very interesting to see that at uh, this point in time we were already thinking about these types of things. And so I've talked now about the OCL uh, 2.0 standard, uh, uh, the, the, the running, uh, let's say, IEEE standard XES has just been approved for another 10 years. But uh, already before access was there, we had something that was called semantically annotated MXML. And so that was uh, a semantically annotated uh, storage of event data, where you uh, uh, things like uh, activity names, things like resources, uh, could all refer to, uh, to a taxonomy or an ontology, if you want. And we were exploiting that in terms of the mining. So some of these ideas have been around already for a very long time. Yeah, so at that point in time, we were also reasoning over event data. And we are uh, we're, we're fine-tuning the mining using this type of information. If you look at what is the, the recent breakthrough, yeah, so we have been applying machine learning techniques on top of process mining already for 20 years. However, uh, one cannot deny that with, uh, let's say, the availability of things like ChatGPT, we need to re-evaluate the role of AI in the context of process mining. And so here you see the graph that is showing, let's say, the incredible progress uh, of ChatGPT 3.5 compared to, to version 4, that many of the standard tests that people do ChatGPT can actually do, do better. We've also written, uh, let's say, a few papers on, let's say, applying these large language models to things like process discovery, etc. And also commercial tools, including Salonis, have implemented, uh, let's say, these types of technologies on top of the uh, existing process mining software. So, for example, in the Salonis setting, you can pose a question in natural language and it is translated to a so-called PQL query and this PQL query is running on the normal, let's say, process mining engine. Then results come back and they are again converted, let's say, in a, in a human-readable uh, format. So what is now the relationship between process mining and AI, machine learning and large language models? I would like to identify three areas. First of all, these innovations will allow us to extract new types of data. And so uh, all of these technologies help us to convert unstructured data, for example, textual data, into, uh, let's say, events, or they help us to enrich events. And so for example, if there is, a, if, if there is a, a, an email from a customer, you can see whether this customer is angry or not, and you can enrich your event data with such information. Then there is a traditional area where we have been doing a lot of, uh, let's say, in the last 20 years, that after we have discovered process models, we uh, uh, apply machine learning techniques on top of them. And so after you have identified uh, the process model, you align the data with the process model, you can uh, generate machine learning uh, problems, for example, to predict what is the remaining flow time of a case. Or you can predict what is the likelihood that this case is going to deviate, etc. etc. Nothing new has been around for a very long time already. Uh, what is really new is the way that people are interacting with process mining software. As I see that there will be uh, major innovations with the uptake of generative AI, think of foundational models, large language models, etc. Uh, people 
uh, will be able to interact with process mining software using natural language interfaces. And uh, we can see already many prototypes available doing precisely that. In the future, I feel that uh, what I was talking about earlier in the context of object-centric uh, process mining and also these semantically annotated event data, uh, which is uh, very much related to storing uh, event data and objects in the way that they really happened in a structured way. Combining that with this, uh, let's say, general purpose large language models like uh, GPT uh, allows us to, uh, uh, to more easily interact with, uh, let's say, such systems, asking the types of questions that you see at the bottom. But in the future, I see that uh, uh, large language models will be extended with uh, things that are organization or domain specific. And, and I think uh, object-centric process mining helps to, to go into that direction. We are coming to an end, so let's uh, come to a conclusion. Uh, I hope I convinced you that with object-centric process mining, one can do wonderful things. Uh, it's still surprising that so few people are working on process mining given the impact that it has in industry and also like the, the incredible, uh, uh, let's say, diversities and breadth of possibilities that it provides. And so it's interesting both from an academic point of view, because not many people have worked on this and uh, you can still, let's say, contribute in a very original way. At the same time, it has a huge business potential because any organization has data, has processes, and is struggling to connect these both two. Using object-centric uh, process mining, we are uh, distinguishing different types of objects. And I've indicated to you that this provides these three, these three main uh, uh, innovations over traditional process mining. So you no longer have to go repeatedly back to your source systems. You extract the data only once, and that serves as a single uh, source of truth that is system agnostic. And so whether you are extracting data from SAP or from Oracle or from Salesforce, if it's the same process, you would like to store exactly the same uh, data. Object-centric process mining allows you to see the interactions between different object types. Most of the inefficiencies, performance problems, compliance problems refer to multiple objects that are inter interacting with each other. Often at the boundaries of processes and organizational uh, units, you can see the, the problems. And last but not least, uh, typically if you, if you try to flatten the event data into a two-dimensional uh, view, you get these distortions that I talked about earlier. And so if you're interested in this, read up in, in papers that talk about the conversions and diversions problems, which show very convincingly that uh, due to these distortions, you may come to very misleading conclusions. Uh, all of this is leading to a new view on process mining where you extract the event data only once and processes are merely on-demand views where you are looking at a certain group of object types and event types from a particular angle. And I think this is very powerful and provides a lot of uh, flexibility. If you would like to learn more about this, then uh, there's lots of information available. I've pointed out, let's say, the OCL 2.0 uh, standard that is also providing many data sets and, and software tools. Um, what you also see here is a, like a white paper and a tutorial paper uh, that will help you to, to introduce these things at a very, let's say, understandable uh, way. If process mining was new to you, uh, I'm also providing some pointers there. There is, for example, the Coursera uh, course that has been around for, for, for quite a while. Uh, at, at this point in time, over 165,000 people already took that course, and so it has been very popular. Uh, there is also a more recent course uh, uh, available uh, also through, through, through the edX uh, platform uh, that, that gives you an introduction to process mining and uh, uh, the corresponding software uh, at a, in a way that is very accessible. 
There are also two books, yeah, so the classical process mining uh, book uh, and the process mining handbook that is open, open access. So uh, again, I'm very, very sorry that I cannot be uh, with you. I would have loved uh, to be at Morocco and, and join your conference. Unfortunately, that is not possible. Uh, so we, ha we have to do it with this uh, recording. I hope that uh, my keynote inspired you uh, to, to look at process mining, specifically object-centered process mining, because I think anybody working in the field of uh, information systems, uh, data science, uh, machine learning, there are incredible opportunities uh, to still make a difference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.